Hello lovely people! Today's video is sponsored by Surfshark. We're going to be talking about the wonderful topic of sexism in the medical field. Are women really discriminated against when accessing healthcare services or are we just being overly emotional? <sighs> Josh, another uplifting subject for you all today and not at all disheartening whatsoever. Look, because hey, not everyone here subscribed to watch my journey into motherhood. And equally, just because I am a mother now, that doesn't mean that that's all that I am. I'm also the girl who likes to get overly sassy in a time honored British way about medical negligence and the short straws many draw at birth by being born into a society that sees neutral as able bodied, neurotypical, straight, white, and cis. So, yes, subscribe if you haven't already to see my usual warm and informational content covering topics ranging from invisible disabilities, queer history, History, chronic illnesses, vintage fashion, lesbian life, and now there will be a lot of adorable baby content coming up and things about how I'm finding being a disabled parent. Life as a family with two mums. And wow, being a non gestational parent is wild. So our son is six weeks old, and every time someone in the park sees how small he is in the pram, they comment on my weight. Where do we go from there? Should I say, Oh, I didn't give birth to him, my wife did. So they can then comment on, on her instead? Like, not particularly keen on that. Please offer help in the comments because I have no clue. Oh, bear in mind this is England though, so everything I say to them will seem rude, but also everything they say to me seems rude. But let's discuss systematic oppression against women that results in ambivalent care, immense pain, and life-threatening situations. Yay, fun, right? Perhaps my sleep deprivation is warping my sense of fun. I think it's just that being around a lot of babies and women who have just given birth at the moment has made me think even more about female healthcare than I normally would, and wow, the massive inequalities within that. But we will get into it. So gender inequality manifests itself in a number of ways in the medical field, but broadly speaking, it is the disadvantage that women face when accessing effective healthcare. And I'm going to be talking a lot in this video about men and women in this medical textbook biological terms, and whilst that is very rigid when human bodies are actually really varied. It's what the information we have available gives us, and it does still highlight a really big problem, but it also brings up another issue and inequality, which is a lack of research. So I can talk to you about the inequality in care of those who, on a form, have the box marked F crossed, and those who have the box marked M crossed, but until every form has more than those two boxes, and until actual cash money is invested in research, we cannot properly evaluate where the system maybe is failing people who do not live within that binary. And without that, we're actually failing the community as a whole. Because that's how society works. We are one organism. Don't believe the hype. Again though, we will be dealing with some very heavy topics in this episode, so if that is too much for you, understood, click away. But if you're sticking around, please shields up and defend yourselves with your very own some such tosh pen, available either on the merch shelf below this video, or if that isn't turned on your country yet, by going to bit.ly slash lovely merch, where you'll find in the description. Whilst women are disadvantaged in healthcare for a variety of reasons, such as socio-economic background, race or government policy, there is a plethora of evidence to show that bias in favour of men is rooted in the medical field itself. Workforce. First things first, just looking at the workforce of the healthcare sector shows an imbalance. Whilst women in history have taken the leading role in being caregivers in the family setting, once that role became available in a professional capacity, only men were considered good enough for the job. Historically, men have dominated the medical profession, mainly because they were allowed to become doctors, whereas women were told to sit at home and look after the children and bake and make themselves look pretty. And yes, I do I enjoy all of those things, but I could be a doctor too. Fun fact, one of my great great aunts was the first woman to be allowed into her university to study medicine, um, but wasn't allowed to graduate because she was a woman. Still took her money though. Weirdly, the way that we experience our gender doesn't actually define what we'd like to do for a career path. Who knew? Eventually, when women did enter this field, it was primarily for taking care of patients in roles such as nurses, which, whilst hugely important, didn't give them a place at the table for discussing women's health issues, because apparently that responsibility was far too complex for the female brain. Male doctors in history have been perceived as the pinnacle of education and society, put on a pedestal for us to gawp at as the key to helping us all live longer, with no thought put towards women being up there with them. Women 
women continuously struggled to be able to enter into medical schools. In 1874, Edward H. Clarke, a professor at the Harvard Medical School, said that women seeking advanced education in medicine would develop monstrous brains and puny bodies and abnormally weak digestion. This is Tosh Edward Tosh. Harvard didn't actually admit women into their medical school until 1945, after a number of lengthy debates. One of which came from the assistant professor of gynaecology, John T. Williams. Sounds like a delightful man. He said, While I am willing to agree that there are some very able women in medicine, pro-feminists are apt to overlook the fundamental biological law that the primary function of women is to bear and raise children, and the first societal duty of women is to develop and perpetuate the home. Oh, I thank you, John, for your insightful contribution to the conversation. I'm going to file you into the part of my brain named people I've heard about but would rather forget the existence of. Luckily, since then, access to medical education for women has significantly increased. And as of 2019, women enrolling in medical school has overtaken male enrollees for the first time ever. However, just to sprinkle some pessimism in there, male doctors uh, still outnumber female doctors by um, a wide margin. 64% to uh, 36%. So why is this all relevant? Why does this imbalance in the workforce affect the way women receive healthcare? Well, the fact that men have dominated the medical field has led to a huge bias against women in medical research, where health issues unique to women have been largely ignored. This means that the female body has uh, historically been misunderstood. Have women been given incorrect diagnoses and medical treatments? But before I explain how this plays out in reality, a word from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Surfshark. Surfshark is an app and browser extension that allows you to change your virtual location, ensuring you access to sites, services, and content that you can't usually see. So yes, <clears throat> sure, Surfshark, VPN, excellent, means that you can, you know, watch stuff that you normally can't see, but also helps shield your identity from websites, apps, and services that want to track you. You can use it across an unlimited number of devices as a whole family, meaning no internet provider, mobile carrier, or anyone else can listen in, see your activity, thanks to their super strong layer of encryption. But really, I mean, are we, <laughs> have we talked about how great it is at expanding your knowledge? I have access to unlimited amounts of documentaries like Diagnosis from the New York Times, a docu-series about rare medical conditions. So pretty handy right now. If there's a series available in another country, but not in yours, it's just really easy to switch Surfshark over to that location. And then, there you go, knowledge. Click the link in the description and use code JESSICA for 83% off Surfshark plus three extra months for free. They're for a 30 day money back guarantee, so go, 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 go. Bypass the content throttling, government censorship, and the uncomfortable feeling that you're being tracked. No, really, your internet provider tracks your web history and file downloads, advertisers track your browsing patterns and search history with cookies, and even those friendly looking websites record your IP address and data every time you visit, so. Oof, that was scary. Let's go back to today's uplifting subject. So let's look at all the ways that women have been misrepresented in medicine because that's exactly the upbeat, fun time video you are here for. Click the notification bell to receive more heartwarming content like this. The discrimination faced by women in healthcare can be bucketed into two themes. The first is lack of knowledge. You don't know enough about women. And the second is lack of trust. We don't believe in women. These two themes combine and form a delicious recipe of women's suffering. Yum. A lack of knowledge. Due to gender bias entrenched in medical history, even the best of doctors sometimes don't have the optimum tools to treat women effectively, as women were just not researched enough. One huge factor was the lack of female representation in clinical trials. Historically, it was assumed that men and women were pretty much the same, except for size and reproductive systems. It was deemed that the white man of about 70 kilograms was the closest thing to normal in medicine. Let's name that 70 kilogram white man Edward Clark, after our monstrous brain and puny body friend. Any results that fell outside of what Edward experienced were deemed abnormal. So Edward is the norm. If Edward takes an amoxicillin to treat his tonsillitis and it works, then researchers think, hey, that works on Eddie, it works on anyone. That idea meant that medical researchers just didn't think it was necessary for women to be included in clinical trials. They just needed a bunch of Edwards to conduct research and apply the results to women. And, and so women just weren't included in trials. Until 1993. That was less than 30 years ago. Let me know in the comments if you're younger or older than the inclusion of women in medical research. 
Another reason for the exclusion of women in clinical trials was that really inconvenient thing called the menstrual cycle. Oh, it just gets in the way with all those hormones flying all over the place that would just overcomplicate research studies. Oh, oh. oh, you think I'm being sarcastic? I don't blame you, it's my go-to choice for comedy. But really, that is why people who menstruate weren't included in trials. So men and women were considered essentially the same. Cycles and hormones were just too annoying for researchers to include in their studies, even in studies that were about cycles and hormones. It was just easier to only study people who don't menstruate, so that cycles didn't, you know, skew any results. The very reason that people who menstruate needed to be included in studies, i.e. because our cycles literally affect our health, is the reason we weren't included. Where do I scream into? Where? I shouldn't scream because it will wake the baby, but you know, know that if I didn't have a six week old baby, I would be screaming. The irony that living out those who menstruate out of drug trials would form more accurate results is totally absurd. It's like baking an apple cake, but using oranges instead of apples and telling your friends it's an apple cake. It's not an apple cake. You used oranges and zero apples, so it can never be an effective apple cake. This makes sense, right? I'm, I'm saying that you're testing your birth control pill on people who do not need birth control pills. And then when they don't have adverse effects, you're just rubber stamping it for those who do need birth control pills. I mean, what? Over is the apples. That's the key takeaway from this video. I think my sleep deprivation is kicking in again. Lastly, women were excluded from clinical trials because it was feared that they could affect future fertility, or if they were pregnant, affect their baby's health. The thalidomide scandal was a tragic example of this. However, growing a human being is not plain sailing most of the time, and 80% of pregnant people use some kind of prescription drugs during their pregnancy. These medications have not actually been tested on pregnant women for the fear that the medication might harm the unborn fetus. Let's just take a moment to be clear on this. Researchers won't test the drug on pregnant people because it might harm the baby. So the solution has been to test it on non-pregnant men, pass it off as harmless, and then just give it to pregnant people anyway. Is nobody seeing the problem here? A study in the early 2000s found that 90% of drugs approved by the US Food and Drug Administration between 1980 and 2000 had an undetermined potential to cause abnormal fetal development. 90%. Even though you now legally have to include women in clinical trials, it's not usually a 50-50 split. The endovascular occlusion device is, for example, an important device for managing blood flow. Only 18% of trial participants were women. Also, women suffer from more severe heart attacks than men, yet women only represented 32% of trial participants on coronary stents. Yet on the flip side, 90% of people in trials for facial wrinkle correction and 92% for dental device trials were women. And studies have shown that there are key differences between male and female bodies that must be considered in research. Recent research has shown that there are sex differences in every tissue and organ system as well as how a disease operates and spreads. But sadly, there are a number of researchers who still argue that women shouldn't be included in research, not because sex differences don't matter, but because there is insufficient historical data on women. Toshiness of the tosh. So shouldn't collect it now because the past was sexist. So we should we should just keep that keep that going. What? So the cycle just continues. <laughs> Great logic. I'm so glad these people are doctors. This significant bias in research means that the way that diseases, chronic illnesses, and medicines affect women are, are insufficiently understood, leading to either long diagnosis times or incorrect diagnosis, as well as suboptimal treatment for women, and those who present as women as well. Drug administration. So, let me explain how this plays out in reality. Firstly, studies have shown that women have more adverse drug reactions, ADRs, than men. Are we surprised? Reports between 2004 and 2013 show that more than 2 million women had adverse drug reactions in the US versus 1.3 million in men. Women are also more likely than men to be hospitalized due to an ADR and more likely to suffer from more than one in their lifetime. One reason suggested for this is that men and women are often incorrectly treated equally when it comes to doses. Because historical data has applied results from men to women, drug doses are often administered gender neutrally, but women's metabolisms work differently to 
to men. Women's body fat percentage is different to men. And so studies have shown that women suffer from ADRs and even overdose because they're being administered too high a dose. Secondly, a lack of research into the effects of heart and cardiovascular disease on women has had tragic consequences. Women actually present different symptoms to men when they experience heart disease, but because of the lack of women used in research, this isn't as widely known. So it can often go undetected in women. We're also all really used to seeing on TV that classic thing of someone's having a heart attack and oh my goodness, they're clutching their chest and feeling the tingle in their left arm. Ow. But that's not how women experience a heart attack. In the case of a heart attack, while both men and women can experience the typical symptoms of chest pain, women are much more likely to suffer pain in different locations, such as in their back and shoulders. Those symptoms aren't often directly associated with a heart attack, and so there can be a delay in treatment which can have fatal consequences. A Swiss study in 2019 found that women received treatment for a heart attack 37 minutes later than men as a result of this. Another study by the British Heart Foundation also discovered that women who suffer heart attacks are half as likely as men to receive the recommended treatment. For example, only 15% of female patients received a stent versus 34% for men. A lack of trust. As I said earlier though, it's not just a lack of knowledge that's causing unnecessary suffering. For women, it, it's a lack of trust in women. For hundreds, if not thousands of years, women's pain has been downplayed by men in science who attributed their health issues, you know, <laughs> overreacting, being hysterical. <laughs> I have a whole video on female hysteria here, so you can dive more deeply into that. I mean, talk about your womb just going for a wander around your body, bumping into your organs. <laughs> it's a fun one. <sighs> Recent studies have shown that physicians are more likely to perceive men's symptoms as a physical issue and women's symptoms as psychosocial, i.e. either in their heads or caused by their surroundings. Hmm. Hands up if you're a femme-presenting person who has been asked, are you under a lot of stress at the moment by a doctor when talking about a clearly very physical problem? Oh, including a torn ligament that had my foot hanging off. Which is not to say that stress cannot cause physical reactions. It can, but I had just told him that I'm full nervous. So. As such, women are prescribed more psychoactive drugs or over-the-counter drugs than men. For example, a recent study into psoriasis treatment found that the seriousness of the disease was no different between men and women. However, men would receive more clinic-based treatments and women would just receive over-the-counter emollients feeds into this idea that women are just not taken seriously. Our symptoms are not serious or over-exaggerated, so we're under-treated and under-diagnosed. This can be seen in chronic pain, where women are more likely to be recommended psychotherapy than men who are more likely to receive actual pain medication. This is the gender bias we see when discussing pain tolerance. Pain is real for men and in the heads of women. To add insult to injury, almost three quarters of people with chronic pain conditions are female, but yet in the 2017 study, 80% of pain trials used male humans and male mice. Even mice are beating us at this game? We deserve better than this. Where is the female mouse equality part? A similar lack of trust in women's pain is also evident when looking at the chronic pain condition endometriosis, a painful cancer-like disease which causes cells to grow around the uterus. The length it takes to receive an endometriosis diagnosis is proof of this, seven and a half years. Let that sink in. On average, it takes seven and a half years to be diagnosed with endometriosis, which means seven and a half years of unexplained pain, disrupting your work, your relationships, your hobbies, everything. And it's the most common gynecological issue in the UK, affecting 10% of those who have a uterus. Symptoms of endometriosis include abdominal pain and heavy flow. So first, we often don't seek help quickly enough because we pass it off as period pain, something we're just, you know, taught to accept. But when we do seek help, it's often passed off as just, you know, your cycle. Mm. Women's health. The problems of diagnosing endometriosis show a lack of research into women's reproductive health or health issues that only uteruses experience. In the last 20 years, there have been 5.5 times more studies about male infertility than female infertility, despite the fact that over 30% of women will suffer from a reproductive or gynecological health issue, only 2.5% of publicly funded research is dedicated to it and 90% of women are affected by premenstrual syndrome. However, there is five times less research into this than erectile dysfunction, which affects only 19% of men.
Gasp, I am truly shocked by your erectile dysfunction statistic. And then there's the topic of contraception. Turns out, not much research has been done into the impact of using hormonal contraceptives on your mental health, despite mood-related issues being one of the most common side effects. In fact, 2-3% of girls between 15 to 19 who are on hormonal contraception will suffer from depression. Similar side effects were found in trials for male contraception. 10 years ago, human trials found the male pill was an effective birth control method, but because potential side effects of depression and mood swings were found, the trials were stopped. To those of you on contraception, I see you rolling your eyes whilst you're currently battling, you know, mood swings, weight fluctuation. Libido. Thanks to your birth control, I mean, yeah. Really, it's just another example of, well, you're all emotional wrecks already, so just a few more mood swings, you know, won't really matter. I mean, you can just picture that middle-aged doctor saying that, can't you? Oh, 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 he's got a white beard, and you want to pull it. Right, conclusion. Today, research is still playing catch-up, 25 years after women were allowed to participate in clinical trials. This is just scratching the surface of this topic, which is, of course, a significant intersectional issue as well, because boy, we haven't even really covered that. Bi POC and trans communities face further discrimination in healthcare and are even more poorly represented. We have only talked about today one aspect, a very, very broad overview when it comes to female healthcare. For example, cervical cancer mortality rates are higher for black women than any other race. However, in clinical trials that took place in 2018, black women only made up 5% of participants. There's also evidence to show that black people are perceived as having a higher pain tolerance than white people. A study found that black children with appendicitis were less likely to receive the correct pain medication than white children. So there's a huge amount to be corrected here, far beyond what I have touched upon today. This isn't about individual doctor's behavior towards men versus women. This is a systemic problem rooted in biased medical education, gendered research, and historically sexist perceptions of women that has created a culture where medicine has become intrinsically biased towards men. This means that gender blindness is still very real, and a vast amount of current knowledge about diseases, symptoms, and treatment is formed without considering the impact on women. Women are literally dying because of these gender biases. I want you to know, firstly, well done for making it to the end, but look, the pain that you are experiencing, whatever it may be, is valid and it deserves to be treated as so. You deserve for your pain to be believed and treated correctly. If you can, try to find a second, third, fourth opinion until you fail, you have received the right diagnosis and the treatment that works for you. Because my God, no one should be suffering in silence. You are your best advocate as much as it sucks to have to do that for yourself. As much as you shouldn't have to, as much as there should be people within that community fighting your corner for you and you shouldn't have to be the one doing it, sometimes I'm afraid you have to. But know that you are not alone. And I am sure there are many, many people in the comments sharing a similar journey to you. Thank you so much for watching today's video. It was a pretty heavy topic. So please, now, go get some light relief. Ah, <sighs> go and watch Baking Bad, okay? It's a playlist where I attempt to convince my wife that baking is fun, um, and instead we just, we just create chaos. Remember to click the link in the description and use code JESSICA. 83% off Surfshark for three months, extra for free. For actual online safety, that, that is important. And if you would also like to express your very British displeasure, then you can pick up your very own some such tosh enamel badge either on the merch shelf below this video or if it isn't available in your country by going to bit.ly slash lovely merch which is also in the description and I shall see you next time. Mwah.